Good evening, I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Heather Campion, CEO of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming and acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, Raytheon, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation and our media partners, Xfinity, Viacom, the Boston Globe, and WBUR. The story we tell in this building is about two immigrant families, the Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds, who came from Ireland in the midst of famine, arriving in Boston through the harbor just behind me. They worked first as coopers, then tavern owners, as mayors and bank presidents, ambassadors and congressmen, until eventually one of their own became the 35th president of the United States, elected in large measure with the support of others who considered themselves recent immigrants. John F. Kennedy once wrote a book entitled A Nation of Immigrants, in which he pointed out that every American, with the exception of those whose forebears were indigenous to these lands who were bought, brought here tragically as slaves, was either an immigrant himself or a descendant of one. Throughout his political career, he advocated for changes to our immigration system, which had previously favored applicants from Europe and urged that people of all nations be put on equal footing for immigration to the United States. We're so pleased to host this evening's special session along with the Boston Globe. And our moderator, Marcella Garcia, is a contributor to the Globe's editorial page and a frequent guest commentator on public radio. At this year's Profile and Courage Awards ceremony, all in attendance were deeply moved by the heartfelt words delivered by one of our two winners, Mayor Paul Bridges. I'll let him retell his story in more detail, but the political support he enjoyed in his small town of Uvalde all but eroded when he protested a new state law that criminalizes Georgians who knowingly interact with undocumented individuals, including the migrant workers who helped harvest his community's onion fields each year. Under the new law, the mayor himself, who regularly gives rides to friends who are undocumented immigrants, would be guilty of a crime. In his speech at the award ceremony, he modestly suggested that he did not feel he was worthy of the award, nor had he done anything courageous at all. He was simply treating others the way he wished they would treat him and his family. Jennifer Hochschild is a pre professor of government and of African and African American studies at Harvard University. Her scholarship focuses on the intersection of American politics and political philosophy, particularly in the areas of race, ethnicity, and immigration, as they relate to education and social welfare policy. And if you'll allow a personal note, she was my advisor when I was a master's student and is a wonderful teacher and mentor. It's always an honor for me to introduce and to welcome her here. Luann Rice is a New York Times best-selling author whose latest book, The Lemon Orchard, recounts the story of an undocumented immigrant who loses his daughter in the desert when crossing the border in search of a better life. According to one reviewer, trust Luann Rice to find the humanity in illegal immigrants, a topic too often rele relegated to rhetoric or statistics. The novel is on sale in our bookstore and Ms. Rice has agreed to sign copies after the forum. And I should also note that we'll be taking written questions from the audience this evening, so please write them down and pass them to the staff members who will be circulating through the forum. Remembering his own family history, President Kennedy wrote, our attitude towards immigration reflects our faith in the American ideal. We've always believed it possible for men and women who start at the bottom to rise as far as their talent and energy allow. Neither race, nor creed, nor place of birth should affect their chances. We're all aware of the national gridlock on immigration reform that affects the chances of so many who live among us. And tonight we hope to humanize this issue through stories told through fiction, in the halls of academia, and in one small farming community in rural Georgia. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Kennedy Library, Luann Rice, Paul Bridges, Jennifer Hochschild, and Marcella Garcia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd like to start with Paul, and um, you know, like Tom said, we all come from very different backgrounds, Luann using art to tell his stories, uh, Jennifer using academia and research, and uh, Paul in politics. Can you start by telling us about your firsthand experience in Georgia, why you decided to, as a Republican politician, why you decided to stand up 
for immigrants against this law. Tell us your story. Well, I prepared some notes because my mind isn't where it used to be, isn't, isn't quite as sharp, so I'd <laughs> like to, to, to refer to my notes if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Globe and the JFK Library for hosting this and giving me an opportunity to talk about immigration reform. Um, it's an important issue, and I'd like to offer you Bostonians a, a, a peek into the farmlands of Georgia. Um, I, I was born in Vidalia, Georgia, and I came from many generations of farmers. I was one of 12 siblings, and each of my parents were one of 12 siblings. <laughs> <laughs> Big family. You probably know why farmers have large families, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> it, no, 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 it's not, it's, not, it's not because the fire went out in the fireplace. It was because the more hands that they had to work the fields, the more prosperous the farm was. And um, I, I've been presented with several opportunities to talk to people, to ask them to, to, to let us intellectually evaluate the economic and social aspects and the impact on our nation of those hands that currently work in our fields. Um, in my particular local area, I was mayor of Uvalde, a small town about 20 minutes south of Vidalia. I joined a lawsuit against HB 87. Um, though I had um, spent many years ridiculing the ACLU, and I, 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 <laughs> I could not have done what we did without their support. So I now publicly apologize to the ACLU. <laughs> And, and, and give them my appreciation, as well as to the Southern Poverty Law Center, who, who did excellent representation for me in this lawsuit, and we won. Um, HB 87 was supposed to be an immigration law, but instead it, 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 it targeted immigrant Latinos, U.S. citizens, and, and documented crew leaders, farmers, or anyone who was associated with the support structure of an undocumented person. Uh, and, and many of them were, were, were farm workers. This new law signed into, signed into law by our current governor redirected, redirected police resources. Uh, it made a criminal out of anyone who invited an undocumented person into their home or into their automobile. Economically, South Georgia is greatly supported by farming. The economy is driven by the agriculture which pumps about $6.85 billion into the economy. Well, that agriculture is driven by undocumented people, which wasn't the case a few decades ago. The infusion of hardworking and skilled migrant labor has increased the conversion of thousands of acres of corn, peanuts, cotton, soybeans, and other machine-driven crops into other products like the Vidalia onion, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, fruits and vegetables of all kinds. Um, the, the, the products that require skilled labor to harvest, to, to, to package, and to ship. The dramatic change from large acres of machine crop to labor force crops boosted our economies. The Cato Institute study revealed the difference. Corn and peanuts are planted, tilled, harvested, and packaged and marketed almost exclusively uh, by machine without the pressures of Mother Nature on the harvest. Corn has a gate value of about $800 per acre. The world famous Vidalia onion, however, requires an extensive labor force in short windows of harvest time that is dictated by Mother Nature, and it has a gate value of about $9,700 per acre. From that, the farmer must pay the labor force who, turn, who in turn rents housing so that the landowner can pay the property and school taxes. The laborer also buys gas to get to and from work, paying the fuel taxes that maintains our roads. They buy groceries. They buy um, the same goods and services that the rest of us buy. And they pay the same 7% sales tax in Georgia that everybody else pays. Those sales taxes support the municipalities and the county governments which in turn provides the social services that are provided to everyone. Most of these immigrants, I should say many, probably most, um, use federal tax identification numbers, the ITIN numbers, that looks like a social security number, but it isn't. It's a federal ID number that allows them to file their income tax returns by April the 15th, just like the rest of us, and most of them do. 
again, the $9,700 gate value per acre of corn compared to the uh, of the of the products mm -hmm. the Vidalian as compared to eight hundred dollars per acre of, of the Vidalian is not just peanuts <laughs> to our economy. The world famous onion is now marketed overseas in addition to the many vegetables and fruits that are cultivated today as opposed to yesteryear needles from pine tree farms are harvested as pine straw also adding to the tremendous financial boom in our local economy. Several efforts to replace this labor by machine has failed. The pine straw industry was created solely by the support of the immigrant community, did not exist before them, and now it's a multi-million dollar business. I reject the term low-skilled labor on, on these people who do this work. As you probably would too if you took the time to go out to the onion fields and watch them in their rhythm and their skill in, in, in taking that onion and packaging and marking it and pushing it forward. You would see that it's more than, than just unskilled labor, as well as in the harvesting of the fruits and vegetables. Um, there's a skill to quickly identifying the fruits and vegetables that are ready to be picked and, 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 care, and carefully picking and, and packaging and, and, and carrying them to the processing barn. They do this all with skilled precision labor. Our farmers move from the machine crops only because of this available labor. Our blueberry plants have cross-pollinated and today's plants are greatly improved. Honeybee farms have sprung up. We've created dry storage for the Vidae onions so that we can ship almost year round. None of this would have been realized if we still relied on family member and neighbor hands to gather, process and ship as we did when I was a boy. Socially, the landscape has also changed dramatically. When crossing <clears throat> to and from the home, their homeland uh, wasn't so dangerous, the working men of the family came over and worked during the, the months of the growing season and the harvesting, and, and then returned home for several months, and the cycle repeated annually. Eventually, the family was brought here so that the important father figure and family oriented structure remained intact. Today, Latino students often undocumented are homecoming queens valedictorians, salutatorians, honor graduates. They are, they are close friends with classmates, fall in love and marry outside of their community. Mixed status families are numerous and ties multiracial communities, church communities, and civic organizations. The once invisible farm worker family is now embedded in the social fabric of small communities like mine in Uvalde. Um, I, I, I have a lot more, but I'm going to let it go because it seems to go on and on. But you get, you get the idea that, that we have the needs in, of socially, uh, social change that need to be embedded in our current laws and how bad the, the current immigration system is. In closing, I'd like to say a few words about how the influx of immigrants answer the call of need rather than just sneaking under the fence. I volunteer at the Atlanta Olympics and know firsthand that the grounds, the roadways, and the venues would not have been ready for the events without the immigrant workers. They were brought here by our government. The disaster of Katrina was repaired much quicker than it would have been without the immigrants. They were brought here by our government. So I'd like to dispel that idea of that the reform is just for uh, the, the people who snuck in. The American Families Act was not even discussed in Congress, which would reunite families who have been separated and broken apart by the awful current system that we have. Um, Senate Bill 744 that moved from the Senate to the House was never brought up for discussion or, or debate or vote for on the floor. And Congress is now taking a 54 day recess without any of these discussions. And it's, 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 it's a tragedy, it's, it, it, I'm ashamed of it. And I hope that other Americans feel the same. Um, we must acknowledge the, the contributions of immigrants. We must find a way to identify, give permission not only to work, but ability of upward movement. We must focus on educating all children and stop roadblocks that mean-spirited politicians place in front of our people. <laughs> I feel like a volcano. I just want to give you all this stuff. That's good. That's good. <laughs> but, but I want to to tell you thank you for listening to me and thank you for allowing this conversation, this dialogue of, of immigration reform to continue. Thank you.
Thank you, Paul, for Thank those you. words. Um, and you obviously are talking about the contributions, the economic contributions of immigrants. As you were saying, it doesn't take an economist to calculate or to see that immigrants bring economic and financial contributions, yet we only hear about the cost. And I'd like to bring Jennifer in. What can we do you know, to move the needle in the national debate as it, you know, as it um, relates to politics? Why do we always hear about the cost? Why, what can we do to highlight those contributions? Uh, the answer is it's very difficult. <laughs> One of the kind of the, the conventional wisdoms of political scientists, and certainly of politicians, I would assume, is that if you have a situation with concentrated costs and diffuse benefits, that's a really difficult political circumstance. So what you have are communities, now you've been describing a community with concentrated benefits. You see very clearly the benefits of having a particular population. But that's relatively unusual for most of the population, as you well know. What people see are anchor babies, so tremendous costs for hospitals, of health care, lots and lots of immigrants, documented or not, in elementary and secondary schools who might need special education, then English is not a native language. It, you can always find some immigrant who has committed some crime that arguably would not have been committed had that person not been. It's easy to see the costs, and they're, they're real. I think one of the political messages we need to both tell ourselves and say out loud is that there are costs to immigration. And they're particularly <coughs> located in specific communities and specific states and specific sort of gateway metropolitan areas. What is much harder to see are the benefits. Uh, the fact that all of, you know, our lettuce and avocados cost less at the grocery store, you know, 50 cents less per head of lettuce than it would have cost at somebody. It, it, you, you could do the arithmetic and see it, but, you know, nobody knows that when they're grocery right. shopping, right? Um, people sort of recognize that, you know, food is more interesting and music is more interesting and movie producers are disproportionately immigrants. I mean, you can see certain kinds of cultural benefits. But it's very, very difficult to see the benefits for the population of a whole of having a people who are highly skilled but low-wage workers in agriculture, in services, in construction, in childcare, in a whole series of places. The, the broader set of benefits that we have a relatively young population uh, coming to the United States in a context where many of us are not relatively young anymore um, is really important for the long-term economic never mind cultural and social future of the United States, but that's long term. So it's hard to see. So you've got to figure out a political strategy that recognizes and accommodates the perception of very high costs while making it extremely clear as much as you possibly can that there are very, very considerable be benefits for the country as a whole, for the, you know, the age distribution, for the culture, for our daily lives, and so on. That's not an easy thing to do. Right. The other thing that makes this complicated, I'll try to think about some way of solving these problems, is one other thing that I would add that makes it complicated, which is we think of Congress as being a sort of a single unitary body, or maybe the House of Representatives and the Senate as being kind of two unitary bodies. They're not. They're 535 individual entrepreneurs. And each member of Congress lives in a very specific political, social, economic, demographic, immigrant-related context. And they don't really care very much if other members of Congress live in a different environment because it doesn't make any difference to whether they're going to get reelected. Right. So one of the things you have to think about is how to make it politically viable for a member of Congress who lives in a state that doesn't have a lot of immigrant descent voters, who is hearing in the newspaper, hearing from his constituents that you know the hospitals and the schools and the this and that's are being overridden, overrun. You got to give him or her a political incentive to vote in favor of immigration reform. And I think that's what the Obama administration has been struggling to try to do, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, totally without success. Whether that's a flaw of the Democrats of not having figured out the right formula or whether it actually isn't a very good formula, I think is much less clear. Right. So you need to find a strategy that recognizes, legitimates concerns about costs doesn't make people feel like all they are are being crazy nativists. They have real costs that need to be compensated. And that teaches sort of each member of Congress, or at least half of them plus one, that there are genuine benefits not just to their constituency, 
but including their constituency. Okay. So that's the political fight. That's the political fight. <laughs> Uh, Luann, I'd like to bring you in. You have a very personal story that deals with undocumented immigration. You wrote a book about it. Can you tell us why you wrote this book and to whom? Like, who was, what did you, what was your mission? What did you want to accomplish with this book? Well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here and honored to be here with Jennifer and Paul and you, Marcella, um, and at the JFK Library. And you know, I am a writer, I'm a novelist, so I can't solve anything, including <laughs> <laughs> even my own life. Um, but I, what I can do is tell stories and listen to stories and observe people. And you know, I, I feel as if you know, there's no, the, the practicalities, the nuts and bolts of immigration, the passions that run high on either side. I'm just sitting here in front of John F. Kennedy, you know, and thinking of, the, I grew up with, my dad had a picture of him on his bedroom wall. And so I kind of grew up with that legacy and with the idea of, you know, inclusion and of really paying attention to what human beings are all about and trying to figure a little bit about the human heart. And so that's why I, you know, I dropped out of college. I became a writer. And I, you know, most of my work is about families and it's about, um, Families on the East Coast, because that's where I grew up. A few, a few years ago, I, I moved out to California for two years. And my whole life and perspective changed out there. Um, I met a, an undocumented man named Armando, who is um, he's a, a skilled, he's a, he's a carpenter. He's a worker. He came to fix my deck. And he would you know, repair my deck every day, and I found myself I couldn't wait till he and his family got there each day because I wanted to hear more about what their lives were like. He had come across the border um, when he was 17 the first time. His grandmother, who had raised him, had made him promise to come home again. And so he stayed in the States for two years, and then he went back. And when he was 19, he, came, he returned. But things had changed along the border. It was much more difficult. It wasn't so easy. It wasn't, as Paul had said, about, you know, at one point it was easier for families to come and go. Well, it had changed. Politically, it had changed, and, re and just physically it had. So when he came the second time, he and his cousin, Tony, um, both nearly died. They, uh, you know, they, it was hot during the day. They, had no, they didn't bring enough water. It was cold at night. They nearly froze. Um, the story I tell in The Lemon Orchard is about a, a man who loses his daughter on the way here. He observed, Armando saw that happen. He observed it. Um, and, you know, it just, I had never heard stories like this. My family came from Ireland, poor. Um, they came, you know, looking for food, needing to live a better life. And so I identified with it. But I, you know, to actually be so close to someone and be able to hear firsthand, you know, why he came here, what he wanted, what they was hoping for, you know, why the hardships are worth it. And, and I, you know, it's, it's just been riveting to me, so. Okay. Um, you wrote also, and I, I feel like I have to say, it, if you haven't read it, you, I, I encourage you to Google it. She wrote a very personal essay in the uh, Modern Love section of the New York Times. It's this Sunday uh, feature that tells stories of modern love, and she, described uh, her relationship with Armando, and it's very moving, it's a very uh, emotional tale. Um, and so, you know, it's a very personal story, and, it, and it's very humane. I think it brings the humanitarian aspect um, of immigration. Uh, what has been your reception? You know, have people been mostly positive about the book and your personal story with, about Armando? Yeah, I... Um you know, I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, it, it, is, it is such a controversial subject. My readers have been very embracing, and I, a lot of them have said to me that they felt differently about immigration before they read The Lemon Orchard, that it kind of opened their own, their hearts, or somehow even their own minds to their own immigrant roots and their own st backgrounds. Um, you know, and, and yeah, Modern Love, that, that piece was super personal. I had to... You know, but I didn't really have a choice. You know, sometimes when you're a writer, you don't have a choice. Your material finds you. It's not the other way around. You have to say it. You have yeah. to say it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so. Which is a little bit how you felt, too, Paul. You had to speak up. And can you tell me a little bit about 
it, did you get any backlash? Because obviously as a Republican, nobody would expect you to <laughs> join the ACLU in a lawsuit. And, you know, are you still... Me, most of all, would not have expected Right. That. Are you still a politician? Are you going no, to ever run? I didn't, I didn't rerun for election, and my term ended in December. Okay. Um, I, I'm not a politician. I, 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 I speak for what I believe is the truth. Um, so, yes, I got considerable backlash. The, um, the League of the South came and protested the mayor's um, displacement of Southern white culture, and they put signs up on, on all the four-way stops and the, the flags. And Yeah, I got quite a bit of backlash, yes. So what, have, have you gotten any sense that, we were talking a little bit um, earlier about the Republican Party and how the national rhetoric of the party is, is the one that's very anti-immigrant, but if you go to localities and even some states, you can see that some Republicans are actually much more open and less anti-immigrant than the national chatter. Is that your... No, it is true. Um, privately, these Republicans in the House and the Senate speak in favor of, of my views of immigration. My views are really Republican views. It, it's a conservative view, it's a, uh, it, it's a constitutional view, and it's a Christian view. Um, so in, in individual conversations, they are, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it comes time to vote, they, you know, they've got so many angry calls coming in from the people who are so fearful of change mm. um, that, that they really have to go with the, the flow of the winds at that moment because they're getting so many calls. Right. Let me make two comments. I, yeah. I never did answer your question about how are we going to get there. From yes, here, which is that's the magic. The, the, that, that's the magic question. Yeah. I think there are two points of hope which kind of connect with this kind of humane, humanitarian kind of theme that you're, that, that you're developing. Yep. Um, one is if you, it, it, at the level of public opinion survey data. If you ask people, do you want more migration? Do you want to do something to stop illegal immigration or undocumented or unauthorized, whatever? The answer is yes. The, the surveys are so very clear that Americans are not supported. If you ask in surveys, and if you ask, again, individuals, both politicians and not, do you think that the people who actually live here should be sent home, should be sent back across the border, or would you like to see some kind of pathway that enables them to stay in the United States? Never mind personal conversations. Actually, mm. in public opinion surveys, you have a lot of people who say, yeah, I wish they hadn't come. They make me nervous, but you know, we can't send them home. They're here, they're working, they have families, my kids know, you, you know, throw up your head, we gotta do something to fix this. Exactly what and so on. So, so I think there is a genuine base of support for solving the problem, if not support for more immigration. And I think that's not trivial, I think it's important. The other thing I would say is that this is in large part a generational issue. Mm. Uh, I mean, I have students, students in my class, I'm teaching a class on race, ethnicity, immigration, and, it, you know, my kids grow up, my own children, but my you know, they're growing up in a different world mm. th th than my generation grew up in. And it seems sort of self-evident to them that there will be people walking down the street who are speaking different languages. It seems sort of self-evident that, of course, they're going to be dating people of a different race. Uh, it seems kind of self-evident to them, if you think about the complexities of American families, something like a majority of Americans have a family member, broadly defined, a, a cousin, a nephew, an adopted child, a stepchild, a sister's stepchild, you know, something. Brother-in-law. A brother-in-law mm -hmm. who is of a different race or ethnicity. And that's a majority of the country. Once you know somebody, you know, I don't want immigrants, but boy, my, you know, my nephew's awful cute, <laughs> right? It, it begins to feel different. So I think there's a generation, roughly speaking, the under 35 or 40 year olds, maybe under 30 year olds, you gotta play around with this, who are just growing up in a different world. Mm. And it, it might not be a world they would have chosen. I think there is still a sense of threat for some of them. But, but it is, it's just, it's the, it's the natural world. So it's it, the world well in which, it just, that's how things are. So what you're saying, I mean, do you agree that it's inevitable? Immigration reform is going to happen. When, how do well, we get there? Well, you know, inevitable in the sense that it could be 30 or 40 years from now, right? I mean, it could be. <laughs> that's it, depressing. It, yes, that's very depressing. I don't really mean 30 or 40 years. If, if my story is right that this is a generational phenomenon, right. it may take a decade for the sort of the 25 to 40-year-olds to become the, you know, 35 to 50-year-olds who are now suddenly beginning to hold office.
Right. So I don't think this is going to happen in the near future. I do think that it's not just a demographic story, although the demography, of course, as we all know, the population who are self-defined whites is declining as a share of the American population. The population who are self-defined non-whites is growing. So eventually, there are going to be more voters. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a deeper and actually more positive story, which is that, again, the, under, the, the people who have grown up in a genuinely racially, ethnically, culturally mixed environment they may not like it, but that's their world. Mm. They just, that's their world. It's going to be a while before they actually hold office and run the country. Mm. It's going to happen in local communities sooner. You see it in some local communities already. You see it, you know, the, a, a mayor of a town in Iowa is pleading for more immigrants because otherwise he's got to shut down his schools. Whites are leaving these small towns and he's got a bunch of teachers who don't want to lose their job. Mm -hmm. So please come to my, to my town. So, so it's happening in these very odd, idiosyncratic, mm. often local, often under the radar kinds of ways mm. in which people either just come to terms with the fact that the world has changed, or they come to see a growth in population as the salvation for small Midwestern towns, which otherwise are going to shut down. Speaking of salvation, going back a little bit to politics, everyone thought that President Obama was finally going to enact immigration reform one way or the other. Here we are, you know, almost eight years in and nothing has happened. And, and I would argue that's probably, you know, worse than it was before. They were probably more, um, there was a higher probability perhaps before to enact immigration reform than it is now. Do you agree? What do you think that, how do you, how do you read President Obama's lack of, you know, action in this regard? Just from my I know they're very disappointed. Um, yep. They had had high, very high hopes. And I just wonder if, you know, how much of, of the fear and of the negativity is either being driven or caused by what happened on 9-11, you know, that somehow that's been used as a way of pushing it back, you know, instead of being inclusive or more open, that in, in, in a way that that's like either a, a real fear or a, you know, a manufactured argument against, because it, is, it isn't moving forward quickly. I think there's actually a simpler answer, which is that Obama's a politician, hmm. right? And politicians need 50% plus one of the votes, right. as, as one of them once told me when I was telling him what he ought to be doing in Congress, and he said, what I ought to do in Congress is what's going to get 50% plus one of my colleagues to vote the same way that I do. You know, that's not a justification or an excuse. Just Politicians the have yeah. maneuvering room. They can make choices. They can decide to do the right thing rather than. But if he can't get it through Congress, he can't get it through Congress. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the political issues of these is, is, is overwhelming in my viewpoint because when President Reagan and President Bush were pushing for immigration reform, all the Democrats were opposed to it. As soon as mm -hmm. uh, then, then, we, then we had some Republicans write the Dreamer Act and several other really good really good bills that, that would have been really nice to, to have passed. As soon as President Obama said, yep, I'm for it, they're against it. <laughs> it it's, it's a frustration that's indescribable in my view that instead of focusing on what's best for the country and what's best for the people in the country, that, uh, that they're gonna go with the political wins. We also saw this summer the, um, the crisis with the unaccompanied minor uh, at the border, you know, the Jew, did you think that would help, or, or yeah. you thought it was going to help? I thought it would help. I was Me shocked. Too. Yeah. Me too. Me too. You know, that, that, that this is a country that believes in equal opportunity, that believes in giving a people a chance to get ahead on their own, that believes, roughly speaking, that children are innocent, that children, you know, we, we support education rather than jobs for adults. We, <laughs> and this violated all of that from my perspective. Mm. I, the, the closest I can come to an explanation is kind of a broad sense of fear and anxiety. If you look at the economic recovery, for example, almost all the recovery has gone to the top one or maybe 5%. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who are unemployed or fear unemployment. Their annual income isn't going up. Now, how that translates into deeply hostile signs held up against eight-year-olds it, it is not easy for me to see, but, but I think there is a kind of a general anxiety that gets attached to kids. Yeah. Well, you uh, were... I, I didn't. I didn't view that as an immigration issue. Right. I viewed it as a as a refugee issue. Right. 
but it did have a, a, an effect on the general population's view on immigration. Mm -hmm. Um, Luan, I, I wanna, I'd like to, uh, for you to talk about some of your, you did a lot of research for your book, um, aside from the personal uh, experiences that you had, but you know, can you tell us a little bit, I, I understand you spent some time in the desert in, in some of these uh, places where immigrants cross the border. Can you tell us about that? I did, I, I worked with a group called Water Station um, that is, it's very interesting because it's, it's non-denominational, it's not religious, it's not not religious, it's not political. It's pe there are people from both parties. Um, actually, the founder of it is John Hunter, whose brother, Duncan Hunter, was um, a Republican politician mm -hmm. and who was very much in favor of building the fence and closing the border. Um, and John is also a Republican, but he lives in that area. He lives along the Mexican border. And he realized that people were dying um, of thirst, and so he started this organization, he and his wife, Laura, to place these water barrels in, along, the, along the paths where migrants come through. And they're just like these big blue plastic water bottles. They fill them with bottles of water. Um, and so I went down and volunteered with them, and the day that, you know, one of the days, it was 106 degrees that day. Um, I'm from the Northeast. I passed out from the heat. I actually had heat stroke. Um, but before I had heat stroke, I, we, would, we went out in this you know, big Ford 350 down a dry creek bed, and we had, the whole back was filled with, with uh, bottles of water. And it was, you know, I couldn't believe it. It was like a lunar landscape. It was so, so remote. And so um, as I was dry, actually, I spoke to my childhood friend who's here today, I, I spoke to him on the way there, and as I was calling him, my phone was switching from Mexico to the US mm -hmm. along Route 8, along the, the border, and you know, I, I got to the spot, and we, we went out, and Laura just you know, calmly would say, there's a cross we placed last year because we found a body there, a, a man died, and in this spot here, we found one shoe. We found one woman's shoe, and it's like, well, what? How did she? You know, how did she possibly survive without her shoe? Um, I then interviewed a forensic, uh, a forensic um, pathologist who said that woman. You know, she, it might not have been that exact woman, but she had a case where a, a very healthy 30-year-old woman had crossed the border and was coming to the U.S. and she lost one shoe and her group left her, and she just waited for them to come back, and she died of the heat. And it's, you know, it's just such a human thing to me, and uh, I could put myself in, those, in their shoes, literally. And um, you know, so you know, there, was, there was that, and then I you know, found out like the, the people who bring these people across the border, human smugglers who are called coyotes, they used to be kind of a mom and pop operation. Um, in more recent years, it's been taken over by the cartels. So it, it's a very rugged, rugged, rugged landscape, you know, but the people coming are looking for the same things I feel like maybe my people were looking for. Yeah. It's a commercial operation, the uh, coyotes, you know, yeah. they, they, and they adapt and they create new avenues of revenue. They, you know, start also, we were talking it's about, done, can yeah. you talk about that experience, yeah. how they are now trafficking? Well, this woman, you know, the girlfriend of one of my good friends who came across, he would tell me about her, how she worked in a bar. He had, she had worked in a bar, and it had been a bad experience. Well, it took a year for me to find out what that meant, but what it meant was that she had come across um, from Mexico. She was, you know, a Catholic from, um, you know, a Catholic country with a little girl. She had a 13-year-old daughter, and she had come here hoping that, you know, and, pure poverty and violence where they came from. She'd come here hoping to have, you know, make a life and then bring her daughter. Well, on the way here, she got raped twice on the way. Then when she got here, she owed her coyote money. He put her essentially into slavery. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it, they don't call it human trafficking. You know, it took me literally a year to figure out, you know, like the light bulb went on, this is human trafficking. Someone I know who was trafficked. And so she was, um, you know, she was held as a slave in L.A., forced to work in a bar and, you know, and um, be a prostitute. I, I began researching this in New York, where I live, and, you know, the 
one of the largest centers for human trafficking is in Corona Park, New York. Within, it's a subway stop away from Shea Stadium and the um, tennis, national tennis, you know, where the, the US Open is held. It's a middle class neighborhood. I went there and I've gone there many times. Um, you know, like the, the best Mexican restaurants in New York are on this stretch. <laughs> And you walk past, and if you're with a guy, they're going to hand him what's called a chica card. And the mm. chica card is like, it's a little business card with a picture of a woman, but it doesn't say, it'll say florist, or it will say employment agency. It won't say what it really is. And it turns out that behind these closed doors, these women who've come here to look for a better life, but are held prisoner by their coyotes. Um, they owe the money. Because they owe the money, don't see the light of day, and they, they are, you know, are for... It's just horrific. They literally don't see the light of day. They're held as slaves. Is and there anything, any of you, do you think, is there anything that the US government or our country should be doing in these countries of origin in terms of foreign policy or even at the border you know, to try to stop the, the flow? We, we saw some of that with the children because you know, it, it was very clear that these children were fleeing poverty and they were looking to reunite with family here, but because conditions at their Central American countries were perhaps initiated years ago, you know, through direct influence of the U.S. Is there anything that our country can be doing in terms of foreign policy, perhaps, to try to stop that? Yeah. Um, this is really hard, right? Like all the other questions you're asking us. Um, <laughs> so the single biggest thing that has stopped undocumented or illegal immigration over the last decade, people know what it was, the 2008 crash. So one thing we can do is have a really severe depression in which there aren't any jobs, right? Well, because that... It turns out that empirically, if you actually look at the evidence, that's what's... Obviously, that's not a serious solution, but, but the American economy... This is not the children, but the American economy is a very strong draw. And that's probably a good thing in certain ways. I mean, people, if not people that you're describing, obviously, for, who are, for whom this is just a disaster, but on balance, low wage workers will earn three, four, five, ten, twenty 20 times as much in the United States as they could expect to earn at home. Again, this is not the children, this right. is not people who are trafficked, this is kind of your standard vanilla worker, right? The magnet um, is the jobs yeah. and economic So there's a, mag there's a real magnet and it's important. Um, they send a lot of remitt remittances, they send a lot of money back home. So there actually is a redistribution from the Americanized, the American liver resident to the countries, the villages, the families, the communities back home. So one thing the United States can do is try to improve the economies In the of, home of the home countries. Yeah. Because if you maybe had a 10 to 1 ratio, it wouldn't be worth the kind of risk you're talking about, whereas a 20 to 1 ratio of income probably is worth it. So if you could possibly improve the worst off or the, sort of the working communities. Um, it's a little tricky because a lot of countries don't want the United States intervening in their drug cartels. So, you know, you send the United States Army down to northern Mexico, that's going to generate, I mean, talk about foreign policy issues, right? Right, right. So, so how you engage with the serious kind of violence, trafficking, drug issues, without being an overweening colonialist, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a pretty subtle question. Right. So probably on balance, the best thing to do is whatever is possible to improve the economies of the immigrant sending countries. We're, we're obviously most about? talking about Latin America, but this is equally true for Asia, Africa, for any other. Right. What did NAFTA do, Jennifer? Uh, what, how did that affect, do you think? NAFTA probably on balance cut the, uh, it probably improved the economy of Mexico and probably cut the amount of migration hmm in a way that it, it was supposed to do. It probably, on balance, worked. Now, on balance, there's a lot embedded in that phrase, on balance, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of cost to it. There are people who say that basically the immigration issue is, it, immigration in general has slowed over the last four to five years. Mm -hmm. Now, partly this is a 2008 crash story. But on balance, the continued rise in immigration, both documented and undocumented, not refugees, you know, again, lots of caveats here. That rise slowed and pretty much stopped by the end of the 2010s. So one somewhat more, again, long-term positive story 
is that on balance, NAFTA, CAFTA, a variety of sort of foreign policies are in fact sufficiently improve, helping to improve the economy of sending countries that the costs of going through what you're describing are no longer seem to be worth it mm -hmm. to a lot of people. So maybe, again, 10 or 20 years from now, the immigration issue will feel as like an issue that sort of kind of began almost to kind of solve itself kind of by accident, mm -hmm. not because the politicians did the right thing, but because <laughs> the, economy, the economic imbalance got a little bit less. Is there anything that we should be doing here in terms of policies uh, to sort of like crack down more on employers or these businesses that are employing this cheap labor, for example? I, I believe that, the, <clears throat> that we must first have a method of identifying <clears throat> excuse me, those workers who've been doing this work mm -hmm. for 15, 20 years mm -hmm. and, and, and then move into um, punishment for the employers who use people who are undocumented in those areas. But the beginning issue should be to document and allow those people who've developed the skilled labor um, to stay in that workforce mm -hmm. and, and, and identify them so they can have upward movement to move out of that farm labor work and their children can move out of that farm labor work into, more, in, into higher wages and more into the middle class. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that we as individuals must do is identify and, and call mean-spirited laws and mean-spirited politicians what they really are. In Georgia, uh, there are five universities that an undocumented student cannot attend at any price. They are, they are not allowed to attend. Now, it doesn't matter that this student went through high school, kindergarten through 12th grade and graduated with honors. They can't attend one of these universities. And if the, child, if the student chooses a university or, or, or a technical college that's allowed, then they have to pay out-of-state tuition in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Um, and and, and the, the, the personal interaction of, of, of the people is, is important. Um, a student who lives near me <clears throat> went to a program, uh, an accelerated program, at the local co college for her senior year to, to take an, um, a nursing course. And when she got there, she had to pay $900 for this course that not a single other of her classmates had to pay. So she was out as being undocumented. Mm. Um, so the classmates then realized, well, wait a minute, there's not, this isn't right, because you know, this is an honor graduate. And I think we as individuals must call that what it is, mean-spirited. Why is it that we would call ourselves a Republican, but yet put the brakes on someone who wants to get an education? Mm. I mean, we are the education party. We are the family party. How is it that we can keep a member of this family from, from progressing and, and, mm. and moving forward? Um, it, yeah, it, it's not a Democrat or Republican issue, but mm. it sure feels like that at times. Right. Can I make Jennifer, a quick one? Of course. I think you and I might disagree on one point. Not, not very much, but one point. <laughs> I actually don't think we should be punishing employers for hiring undocumented you workers. Do. I think we should be encouraging them, frankly, mm -hmm. in part because the people who, the, these are not very well paid and somewhat exploitative jobs, but they're jobs. And people are killing themselves, literally and metaphorically, to come to the United States for those jobs. It's not a great thing, but it, they believe it's better than their alternatives at home. So well, I think, and the, the other political point I would make is that if anything is going to break the logjam in Congress, it's going to be large employers who want mm. low-wage, relatively docile workers. And they're disproportionately Republicans, and they might have an impact on some fraction of the Republican members of Congress. So I think just in a purely kind of Machiavellian sense from a political perspective, having lots of employers employing lots of immigrants, documented or not, is going to help, is going to help in the long run. Even. Even if the workers aren't, don't have great jobs, yeah. don't have a lot of upward mobility. Right. That seems to be what the individuals are choosing, in effect, by coming to the United States. And I think, in some sense, we've got to give them credit for making the choices that they want, given the alternatives they face. And a whole lot of agribusinesses employing a whole lot of workers can put pressure on Republican members of Congress from conservative states and districts. Mm. But the, the farmers that, who, who I know, um, realize which side of, the, of their bread is buttered. Mm. So they take care of, of their employees regardless of papers or not. So 
and that's always been true, it, that um, I don't see the area that I live in as exploiting the people who work there. Uh, I see the government and, um, and, and the politicians exploiting because they won't allow um, these people who, who are at the bottom rung here to move upward. So, um, so the businesses ought to put pressure on the politicians absolutely. is part of what they ought to be doing. Yeah, okay, so we don't disagree. <laughs> well, some of it has already happened. We, we see it in the high tech uh, community, you know, businesses, uh, companies like Microsoft, Facebook are joining a, or, or are really, really investing in a concerted effort at pressuring, but they want the high skill they want high visas, skill workers, right? Yeah. Do you see a divide in that debate? Like, do you see people more, you know, open to high skilled immigrants versus low skill, which are not really low skill. I mean, you really need low wage, to know, right, yeah, right, right, low wage. Um, well, the immigrant population in general is divided. It's, it, there's a sort of a large, relatively poorly educated, relatively unskilled, relatively exploitable labor force. And then there's a small immigrant population who are very high skilled, very well educated, very professional, very desired. And there's actually not very many immigrants in the middle. So it's a kind of a, a bimodal distribution yep. to yep. use the jargon. Um, there's not a lot of, as far as I know, uh, engagement or mutual sympathy between the two halves. Right. The, 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 the high tech employers want high tech workers mm -hmm. and the construction firms, the large mm -hmm. agricultural businesses want, in effect, low wage workers mm -hmm. and neither really cares much about what the other one wants, as right. far as I can tell. Yeah. So I don't think there's a political alliance there that's very... Mm. That's now, I, very I, was, um, I, I was fortunate to testify before Senator Schumer's subcommittee on immigration, mm -hmm. and it was two panels. Um, I was one of three mayors, and the pan panel before me had a Microsoft executive there who gave a five-minute, perfect, spot-on uh, explanation of why Microsoft needs to have the numbers changed because the current system is so broken. And embarrassingly, he was attacked by a Republican on that, mm -hmm. on that subcommittee and, and who did not understand a single thing of what this Microsoft exec had just got through saying. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is weird. I mean, every other immigrant receiving country, England, France, Canada, Germany, they all get it. are working very hard to encourage high skill workers to come into their country. Right. They, you know, they, they, Except they nobody provide. wants to go to Canada. <laughs> well, there's a lot of high school workers who, yeah. So, so they think that they will benefit a yeah. lot from, you know, computer programmers and nurses and, and sure. bilingual teachers. And, and, and One of the weird things about American politics is that I think disproportionately Republicans, but also Democrats, try to keep the number of high school workers, immigrants down. And, I think we're the only country in the world that tries to discourage high skill immigration, and that's mm -hmm. just weird. Yeah, it has to do with unionization, it has to do with a whole set of complicated reasons. Nativism but, yeah. a little bit, too. I think the nativism is aimed more at the sort of the low, poorly educated, right. sort of opposite end of the, of the immigrant population. Luan, do you care to tell us what book you're writing about now? Are you still focusing on immigration, or? Oh, thank you. I'm. I'm really still focused on the lemon orchard and on immigration. I am working on a, on a new novel, but um, it does involve some of this. And you know, for me, it's just, it's so, so interesting to he hear everyone's thoughts on, on immigration, you know, from such sort of different perspectives. But um, I would like to ask just one thing of you, Paul, if you don't mind. Not at all. What, um, you know, since you know so many of the workers in Georgia and you know them personally, do you find that they, you know, the American dream, quote unquote, that they may have come here for, do you feel that they're happy that they've found it? Or do you feel as if maybe they found some economic relief or, but that their longing for home overrides it? Just Well, I, what I found was the, uh, over the last few years is that these people are just like my parents were. They want better, betterment for their children. And so, yes, in the, in, in the sense that their children are now being provided for in a better way than they would have been back in the homeland, yes, they have, they have reached that, that view and that dream. But they also realize that, that the, their children who are undocumented at this point are stagnant yeah. and can't move forward. And I have to speak from Georgia because I understand that California offers a driver's license to the undocumented and, or will and um, maybe um, 
uh, Illinois as well. But in Georgia, the, the climate is so hostile toward, um, toward the Latino, and I use Latinos because that's the majority I know, but the immigrants are really multinational, and particularly in the, in the Atlanta area, there are many Asians that are, that are in the same boat as the, the, the migrant workers that I, that, I, that I deal with all the time. But to, to answer your question, yes, they, uh, they, they, they are happy with, with the ability to, to provide for their families as they are now. I just wondered. All right, so do you want to ask? Yeah, just a very quick example yeah. of, of what you're talking about. I, uh, uh, this was not a direct interview. I have the, the, the type that you're describing. But um, somebody asked a woman in Los Angeles about, you know, which has some pretty bad schools, right? Uh, how do you feel about the quality of your child's school, expecting to hear a litany of problems, which, of which she could certainly have provided? She said, oh, the school's terrific. And the interviewer said, huh? It's open every day. Mm. <laughs> you know, it dep a lot depends on where you're starting from. <laughs> That's a great point. Great. Uh, we have very interesting questions so, from the audience, so we're just going to... I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, this is an interesting question. Two of them are kind of related. I'm just gonna read them and feel free to jump. Um, most undocumented people in the US pay taxes and never get a refund. How do we get the word out to the average American that undocumented people are paying into our systems and not just living off them? And then a related question, exactly what taxes do undocumented immigrants pay? Income, social security. What did they get back from our government? Um, they pay income and social security too, right? They, they don't get back anything because they, sometimes they use a, uh, an invalid uh, social security number to work. They use the ITN number, ITIN, the uh, individual taxpayer uh, identification number to pay taxes. They get refunds that way, right? They do, do they, not, get they, they do, do not, not get, get refunds. They do not get refunds. But any, oh. anything over, um, the, they don't the get the income, earned income no. tax. No, they, they don't. They don't get any of the benefits that are, that are provided to citizens. But if they've paid more into the system of, of income uh, than, than, than that group would have allowed, then yeah, they get their, their, their money back. But unlike others in that income bracket, they don't get the earned income credit. <clears throat> and if I can just add something, we, um, the, the Globe had a recent editorial on the Social Security Administration and how uh, it, it estimated the amount of money that uh, undocumented immigrants have been paying, and if it, if it had not been for undocumented immigrants contributing to the Social Security Administration, you know, the, the agency would have more and more, you know, graver problems. Um, to, do you want to add something yeah, to Yeah, just in terms of the how do we get the message out. Um, I, this is where, in fact, I think I fall to Obama, uh, or, the, or, the, or the, the, the Obama administration. I mean, you know, the presidency is a bully pulpit, right? I mean, yeah, you know, the, totally. the, it, it's relatively easy to say, yes, immigrant costs, states and localities, real costs. We as a nation as a whole have got to consider that a national issue. It's not just Georgia's problem. It's not just Arizona's. But, 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 look what immigrants are contributing to this country in literal monetary terms, right. social security, income tax, and in more general terms. Seems to me you could say that, those two sentences, relatively easily over and over and over and over. And, you know, president, governors, mayors, will they have an impact on the deep nativism? No. Hmm. Will they have an impact on people who fear losing their job because an immigrant's gonna get paid less? Probably not. You don't need it, you need 50% plus one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if there are enough people who he, are told that message over and over, and, and I don't know why the politicians have been so silent on what seems to me a fairly simple two sentences. Yeah. Uh, you could easily put it on Fox News and change a lot of opinions. <laughs> Just Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, here's a question for you, Paul. What was uh, the court's basis for invalidating the Georgia law? Can you talk a little bit about what exactly the, the law <coughs> said and what, you know, how it, it got invalidated? Yes. Well, the two parts that I was involved in were the um, uh, the housing and transporting of undocumented illegal aliens. Um, <laughs> that was the, the two points that I was on, and those were the two that were struck down. Okay. And the reason it was struck down is because Arizona had already gone through this routine and it had gone to the Supreme Court, and, and the Supreme Court made a ruling in the meantime. Mm. And so then our, um, 
uh, our, dist our, our district as well then use that ruling to invalidate those two portions of the law. Okay. The, the Papers, Please is still in there. And, and, oh, it's and, still in there, oh, the yeah, Papers, yeah. Please? And then, yeah, and the E-Verify is still in there, yes. I think the formal, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because you know much more about it than I do, the legal ruling was that Georgia was taking over a responsibility of the federal, the federal government. government. It's, yes, mm -hmm. they did. So, the, so, so a state may not regulate immigration, that's a federal law. Let me, let me say on that, because I, I attended the, the, the judge's rulings, and, and he made a perfect analogy. He asked the attorney for the state, so you're telling me then that <clears throat> if a child, an 18-year-old, is driving his undocumented mother to the grocery store and gets stopped for, say, speeding or a faulty taillight for whatever reason, and then the officer asked the lady in the car for her papers that this child can go to jail? And so the, you know, this lawyer squirmed a bit, you know, didn't want to answer it. And, and, but she finally had to say, yes, that's, that's true, that this child would be subject to a year in jail and a felony charge for driving his undocumented mother to the grocery wow. store. And our governor signed that thing into law. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is the second part to this question. Do you think, Paul, that the courts can be courted? or more to invalidate into immigrant laws. I'm not sure if I, oh, can be counted on more to invalidate anti-immigrant laws. I mean, what is the uh, current um, atmosphere? I feel like the current atmosphere for anti-immigrant laws has been, um, you know, getting a little better. Is that, I did not know though that the show me your papers was still uh, valid in, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anything, uh, Jennifer, can you add? Uh, Arizona lost a lot of money when it passed its law. There were a lot of boycotts, a lot of very yeah. bad publicity. Uh, athletic teams either wouldn't play there or started wearing jerseys that had, you know, Spanish, they, you know, they, they yeah. translated their, the name of their team into Spanish and Georgia. So it looked really bad. Mm, yeah. uh, Georgia, I think, looked pretty bad. Oh, yeah, we burned our fields, no doubt. Um, a, a lot of businesses complained lost that they that millions you know, of dollars. They, they lost, lost millions a lot of money. So I think other states think whatever we're going to do about this, this isn't the right. Th yeah. This isn't going to work. But but it's 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 not stopping the states like Georgia from passing the thing to keep students from getting higher education. Right. And and there's nothing in the courts that that can eliminate that. It's just the the the, the push by the, the by the people in Georgia to get it changed mm. because the board of regents is ruled by the state, right. not the federal government. Right. Um, this is another question that has to do with politics. Why aren't, why aren't policymakers framing the immigration issue as a small part of a larger problem, the terribly inequitable distribution of wealth within and among nations? <laughs> right. How many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, partly because of campaign finance laws. Hmm. Right. If you want, uh, what a politician most wants to do, or at least first wants to do, maybe not most, is win an election. You're not a politician if you don't win your election. Where do your, uh, and campaigns are increasingly expensive. So this is kind of a trivial, trivialization of a much larger picture, but, yeah. but, but the funding of campaigns, funding of elections in the United States especially, but not uniquely, is disproportionately I mean, the money comes from people who have money, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, people who have money and give a lot of money have a lot of influence. There is, I think, a, a deeper ideological commitment to free markets, to open, you know, too much regulation, too many taxes, depresses the economy, a rising tide lifts all boats, make the size of the pie larger, and we don't have to worry about the slices. I mean, there's all these cliches, but I yeah. think there is a very deep commitment among Americans. Um, maybe especially among elected officials, but, but I think people I genuinely believe that. Right. There are probably 72 more answers, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, should there be any limits on immigration? I'm a Republican, I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easy answer. Oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I just want everyone to be an idealist. And, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, I just, I, keep thinking John F. Kennedy, American Dream. Somehow, I, I don't know the answers. Like I said, I can't solve a thing, but luckily, Jennifer and Paul are here, so. <laughs> yeah, but we have an opportunity. 
My answer is I'm, I start from a premise of open borders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that culturally, socially, I mean, I think about the people who are willing to pretty much give their lives yeah. to come to this country. Why on earth would we want them? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Having said that, so, so I start from open borders and then kind of work backwards to are there any limits that I would want to put. And the, the best answer I've heard back to the open border starting point is that democracy is hard. People have to learn how to be good citizens. Partly it's a language issue, but it's more a sort of a cultural, social, you, you gotta learn how to passionately care and then be willing to back off if you lose, either as a candidate or as a voter. So you really want people to throw themselves into the democratic process and then you want them to say, oh, well, next time we'll do better. Mm -hmm. That, that's hard. Democracy is a genuinely, you need a lot of tolerance, you need a lot of acceptance of people who you really don't like, religiously, personally, racially. It's a hard system to run. And most countries around the world for most of the centuries can't do it. Democracies fall apart. So the best answer I've heard on why not open borders is kind of too many people who are not sort of sufficiently socialized into how to run a democratic political system can swamp a, a country, mm -hmm. even can swamp the United States. How many is too many? It would be millions more than we currently have as immigrants. So, so between right. where we are now and where I would be willing to stop is a very long way. <laughs> Regardless of whether we have open borders or, or closed borders, we must identify everyone who's inside of our borders. We must have everyone to have the ability to be identified. Yeah. Mm. And if they're bad guys, kick them out. If they're not, then give them permission to be here and let them continue to work. So how do you think we should do that? Should we, just, should we grant them amnesty, for example? How do you identify a population that first and foremost wants to be not identified because they're gonna be prosecuted? Like, how do you think we should do that? Is, do we give them amnesty like Ronald Reagan did in 1986? I mean, that's an ideal world. Yeah. It's never gonna happen. But how do we identify that? It happened once. Well, I'm opposed to amnesty. I, I truly am. I believe that the person who broke the law should pay the penalties for breaking the law. There should be a path to citizenship. And, and, yeah, and, 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 and they sh the fines and the penalties and, yep. and, and the taxes and all that should be paid. Right. Uh, to but document there, them. There, there should also be a pathway to redeem yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that Senate Bill 744 was perfect, in my view. Right, right. After 13 years of the person living the, the good life and, 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 and obeying all the laws and could become a citizen or apply for citizenship. So um, Senate Bill 744, in my view, was an excellent piece of legislation that I wish that the Speaker of the House had at least brought up for debate so that we could hear the viewpoints of the various congressmen on the issue of immigration. Right. But unfortunately, he chose not to, and, and they decided to leave, the, leave their work for a while. Yeah. Um, and, you know, t to follow up on that, this is a question that's related. President Obama has had to rely on executive orders to move agendas about which he cares. So, do you see him using this strategy in his last years as president? What are the upsides and downsides of this? Um, as you all know, he did announce that he was going to enact executive orders to deal with or to alleviate the situation of uh, undocumented immigrants, but then he originally said he was going to do it around Labor Day, and then he decided to delay it after the midterms because the Democratic Party realized that that would have probably hurt some of uh, the chances uh, of Democrats running for re-election in, in very key um, areas of the country. So now he has said that he may or may not enact executive orders, correct? Do you agree? I mean, do you think he will still enact or... Well, the, the problem with executive orders, of course, is that if you do it and antagonize enough people, you end up with a Republican Congress and a Republican president in 2016, who right. then simply rescinds the executive orders. Right, right. So, so again, he's got this very fine path to follow between pushing as hard as he probably genuinely wants to do mm. and not generating so much backlash that he ends up with a Republican successor who will simply write a new executive order. No. Some things are harder to rescind than others, but not very. You know, so so, I, it, so he, he's got to calculate, or somebody's got to calculate for him, how far down that road he can go. The other issue I think that if I were in his White House, I would talk to him about. Nobody's asked me, so. Let's um, hope he's watching online. <laughs> it, the health care is his big signature bill. 
his big signature law, the, Ameri the, the, the ACA, the Obamacare. Mm -hmm. I don't think he will do anything to jeopardize that. So, and immigration, I think, like a whole lot of other things, tax relief or inequality, a whole slew of things, probably if I were him, and this might even be what I would advise him to do, it's got to take second place. So not only does he have to calculate what's going to happen in 2016, he's got to bring a whole lot of states along who aren't with him at the moment on the ACA. Uh, and there's a whole series of sort of technical policy issues that, that, that are implied by that sentence. So my guess is that that's what's going to drive his decision making. Now exactly how that translates into one or another executive order, I don't have an answer. Right. But, but I think the ACA is his, is his claim to historical fame. Right. And he's, he's not going to jeopardize that if he can right. help it. On the, on the DACA, the Deferred Action for Early Childhood Arrivals, executive order that he gave, um, it would be almost impossible for a, 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 the next president to rescind that mm. because there would, it would be such a backlash mm. that um, because these, these young people have voluntarily stepped in line for deportation. And if that's not continued, then they're in line and they'd be the first ones to go out in, in the deportation line. So how, how tragic that would be for our nation to lose the, the very people we've educated and, and, and given permission to be here. Uh, I, I don't believe think even could. Romney said that uh, when he was running, that he wouldn't uh, revoke DACA. So that's... Does everybody know something. what DACA is? The For Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's an executive order that President Obama enacted in the summer of 2012, and it basically applies to childhood arrivals, uh, young kids that were brought in by their parents uh, when they were children, undocumented parents, who have gone through this whole educational system here and have essentially grown up here as Americans, except when they go through high school, they realize that they cannot attend college or university because they are, in fact, undocumented. Uh, when President Obama enacted this, what, what it does is that uh, this program, DACA, or initiative, um, gives them a, um, a status and defer deportation. They, they're not eligible to be deported. And uh, it also gives them a work permit so they can go on to college, university, and also work. And join the military. And, of course, join and the military. that's really important. Because that's we, really we what drove need, that. I mean, that's the other thing that this country needs. So right. Not my preference, but... We, you know, we have a volunteer army. Yeah. And not very many people volunteer. Right. Um, right. So if you can get a whole lot of immigrants, yep. documented or not, who are willing to serve, that's going to be very tough to rescind. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what, that was the basis of Romney really not trying to, rev or at least he said that when he was running. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's the stronger element. Uh, another question that relates to Massachusetts. Regarding immigrant populations in Massachusetts, how many countries are represented? The, or does Massachusetts have the first foreign-born representation of all the states in the U.S.? No, right? No. I think we have 17 or 18 percent of our population is foreign-born. Um, and in terms of the immigrant population, I guess it depends on whether you talk about legal or illegal, but the first country of origin, which is not really foreign because it's, a, it's Puerto Rico. It's not really, you know, it's part of the U.S. Uh, it's a territory, right? Is that, it's Puerto, Puerto Rico and Monterrey. In, I'm sorry, in Massachusetts, Puerto Ricans are um, the highest group of immigrants. And then as you yeah, go yeah, down. Puerto Ricans don't call themselves immigrants, as you right. know better than and I Right, and they're so. not. They're really not. They're citizens. They're citizens. So they're really not. I mean, that's their status. Uh, and then Dominicans, there's a, a high percentage of, of um, Dominicans here. And more recently, Central American immigrants you see in places like uh, East Boston or Chelsea, Revere, Lawrence. Lawrence, by the way, it's the city in Massachusetts that has the highest percentage of Latinos uh, immigrants. It's 70%, and they're mostly Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. 70%? 70%. Wow. And uh, after that, I think... Springfield and Holyoke too. Holyoke has the largest percentage of Puerto Ricans in any other um, city in the country. Like, you know, as, as part of the share of the population, more than half of the population are Puerto Ricans. I didn't know that. Yeah, and then oh, Springfield, Worcester, 
uh, Revere, Chelsea, Everett, high percentage of, of immigrants, but those are more mostly recent immigrants, and, and they're, they come from Central American countries, Colombians to uh, not a lot of Mexicans, as you would see, for example, in California or Texas, New York, uh, but that's pretty much it. Um, How about Lowell? Is Lowell, um... Lowell, yes, you know what? Interestingly enough, Lowell has an, uh, a high percentage of Asian right. uh, immigrants. Cambodian, Vietnam, a lot of Haitians from Haiti, you know, here. Cape Verde, too, in Boston. I'm a mentor to a young woman who's from Zimbabwe, and oh, she wow. came from Zimbabwe to Lowell and uh, went through the foster system and is now, I just saw her. She's mm. at UMass Boston studying psychology That's and great. doing great. And um, yeah, but she, she lived in Lowell. And Lowell, yeah, a lot of Haitians and um, yeah, a lot of. Refugees from Africa, Massachusetts is it's home to a lot of refugee populations. Brazilians. Brazilians. Brazilians too, I'm so sorry for forgetting that, yes. <laughs> I'm so, I cannot believe I forgot that. Brazilians, uh, yes, in Massachusetts, uh, I think it's the, lar the, the state that has the largest percentage of Brazilian immigrants in the country for some reason, and this is actually very interesting. I think in the, back in the 70s, they started coming here because there was a connection, a business connection through, um, I forgot where in Massachusetts, but they started coming here and like all immigrants, they follow a word of mouth pattern. You know, people start telling their families or, and all of a sudden you have, you know, the biggest uh, Brazilian population. They live in Framingham, uh, even in, in Boston, in Alston, Brighton. Uh, yes, thank you so much <laughs> for that oversight. Any parting words, any, any um, last, words that you want to leave us with? Uh, Stephen Colbert. Oh my God, do you, yes. do you remember this? You, you may remember this quote. Stephen Colbert testified before a congressional committee on immigration. I don't know precisely the details. And I, I wrote down his comments, and this isn't quite a direct quote, but I think it captures the ironies in this whole situation. Something to the effect of, my great-grandfather didn't cross 4,000 miles of ocean to move into a country that was full of immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that's the historical irony here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not that's my great. words, but I thought they were pretty good. You can always count on him to be eloquent, <laughs> eloquently uh, and humorous. Paul? Uh, just um, get involved. Call your politician. Mm. Call them and tell them. Um, whatever you view, your view is, so that there's a balance of, of those calls coming in to um, to the congressional offices, your, your voice is very important. It's like we always say, it, it's always the people that are angry or negative that comment, and that's, that shouldn't be the case, you know? The, everyone should have a voice, and if you don't think it matters, it does matter, it really does. Luann? I don't know, I just, I'd like to go back to my childhood when I felt as if there was a much more welcoming kind mm. of feeling of idealism and that that was something to strive for and, and com a coming together instead of finding reasons to go apart. And, um, I just look for that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, coming here. Thank you to the three of you. You brought a great perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are good.